This is Podkit, Episode 4, Ads Are Dumb, on Monday, June 22nd, 2015. And now, this episode is loosely considered advertising. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. Welcome to Podkit, Episode 4. Hey, that's this. Yeah. All right. Been, been two weeks. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's been forever. Good to, It's good to be talking with you guys again. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon, for not being here. Gosh. Sorry. Well, we got to do uh, an Apple special instead. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I have that I have that queued up still. That's at the top of my queue. I just haven't had any of my equipment with me for some time because it's been packed in my carry-on baggage since Thursday because I'm trash. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I cannot wait. I cannot. I, I basically, I am such a WWDC novice, so if we get into any of that stuff right now, like, I... I read the articles. I read the show notes of, of the special from earlier in the week, um, but I haven't I haven't listened to any of the podcasts yet from it. I'm trying to do that all this this week as I'm driving to work. But do you guys do you guys have any follow up or follow up from that? Not not too much. Um, I guess the the big ones I've wait, let's see follow up. Um, I'm trying to think through Twitter. Um, I've seen some people hack around with rootless. Mm-hmm. Looks like it might be able to be disabled. We'll see. Um, what else? It basically locks off system, uh, a couple of their folders, and it makes uh, user local re- uh, write only or no read only. One of the two. Mm-hmm. That's where Homebrew installs things too. So that'll be interesting to see what happens. Oh, so Homebrew will, won't work then. It might be write only, but okay. that's not very good either. Yeah. So. Huh. May, I don't know. It might be read only. Who knows? Yeah, I'm. I'm sure someone will come up with a solution. Yeah, interesting. Interesting stuff. Yeah. All right. So let's see. It sounds like you were at a hackathon this weekend, Brian. Is that right? Yes. On Saturday, I had oh, what was it? Seven friends from Morris come on over, and we hackathoned. Uh, they came over at eight or started at eight ten. The last person overslept. You know, we got going maybe more towards nine. 930 ish. Nice. Um, we split into more or less three groups. Um, one group redesigned a website for a humane, uh, some county humane society here in Minnesota, Twin cool. Cities area, um, or city or some, some, some page. Cause it, you know, it looked like early 2000s. Yeah. They did it with, uh, Angular full stack yeoman generator. Oh, cool. What I've used. I wasn't involved with that project at all though, but it looked pretty good. They were nearly complete. Um, awesome. It's on Heroku also, so I don't know the URL, but it does exist somewhat publicly. Um, nice. Another team or duo worked on hooking up a Raspberry Pi, so you can press a button, and their goal was then it automatically loads a pizza website based on your configurations, selects the pizza, pays for it, and orders it to be delivered to your address. So, you know, instant pizza or delayed right. but instantly ordered pizza. Uh, they're trying to use Phantom JS and maybe a couple other tools. I don't think they they never got it working. They're having some issues. I didn't talk to them too extensively about it, so I can't really talk about too much about what they had. But I know I was able to press the button, and they told me it was being pressed. So I nice. pressed that button a couple hundred times. But yeah, and then I worked on uh, my little website, Hey Get Back to dot work, which I started in March. I did initial commit, and then I went back two days in May, I think, and did, like, one commit each day to just touch on it. And so I worked with uh, one of my friends. Another friend helped out a little bit, too. And so we added a, a Favicon, a couple other links, Rickroll page, important stuff. Nice. We did the gradients and had lots of pull requests. So that was fun. Awesome. And, and people kind of sputtered out by, like, 10 o'clock, stopped really working. People were gone by eleven thirty, so it was a long day, but definitely not quite your traditional hackathon because it was just kind of small people, you know, small size, not really official. Didn't go, super, you know, it was probably a little over twelve hours of work time, well, not counting meals, so shorter than most that I've seen. So that's awesome, though. I mean, like it, it's it's got to be cool to like set it up with a bunch of cool like-minded people that you know and and just mess around and make awesome stuff because like 
there aren't a whole lot of environments for that even, you know, right? Even even if even if you know people who are good at this stuff, it's hard to it's it's yeah, it's hard know. to get group of people together and all work on it. And yeah. I think hackathons are good for that because it's everyone who's there is knowing that they're gonna work on something and that's what they're there to do. Yeah. And it was a good way to see friends I haven't seen in a month for most of them and Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I think people have heard it and I've never done a hackathon, so it was a good experience to have. Nice. Yeah, I've been poking Super around cool. your uh, code on "Hey, get back to work." I like the uh, one where it types the message in. That comma delimited sentence. Well, yeah, yeah, it is yeah. comma delimited, but I just like the effect. That's cool. Yeah, it's uh, flash effect plus just sequencing it out. Yep. Yeah, I use animate.css for it's like three thousand lines of CSS for animation. Yeah, I saw that. That was pretty uh, pretty long. Yeah, so that's why my like commit is super high and then i replaced it with the minified version so i don't actually haven't checked so maybe it brought my total lines added and removed to be about the same but Mm -hmm. yeah if anyone listening or you two ever want to add something to it go ahead make a pull request probably accept it if there are any bugs i'll probably just accept and then fix it myself Uh (laughs) so it'll only be live and bad for you know a short time yeah well that sounds good yeah that's awesome though you yeah, you definitely did some really cool stuff with it. That's for sure. Hey, have you guys heard at all about like the Campus Code Fest? I have not. Okay, I'm. I didn't put this in in the show notes before, but it's going there now. Um, this is kind of U of M specific, but it probably doesn't really necessarily need to be. I think it's open to anyone with a U of M internet ID. So I guess it does mean it has to be U of M specific, and I'm lame, but. <laughs> you can uh it's august 20th and 21st it's just kind of a cool way to like hack on u of m stuff uh, hmm. i feel like in the past it used to be open to to uh like more open to the public um actually it looks like it is open to the public so well, it says campus code fest is an event that allows it staff from across the university to organize and work together yeah well if you want to show up and if you're not it staff i'm sure they wouldn't mind Hey, I see that they're, you're a volunteer they're... here on OAuth's 2 server. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh huh. Living that ID- identity management life, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, you're living that life. OAuth, hashtag OAuth, um, yeah. as they could say. A Google Analytics real time API as well. Yeah. I, I signed up for a lot of these, which is probably uh, something that I should put in check a little bit because uh, you can only do so many of them in actual reality but i think i signed up for most of them as like just watching um i, I don't know what, let's see if i can see oh no i did say that i was helping I know someone else who's on two of these here interesting nice so if if you want to uh to check out some really cool stuff a couple of the projects on here that i think are really really interesting is the course in class api um done by a guy named ian whitney um he's with uh He's with uh, one of the offices of the U that works on like uh, uh, um, like student records and stuff. Yep. So if if you're interested in in that and what they're doing there, that is would that be the a good API, that you, to... API that you showed us the other day? That's right. That's yeah, the one. Right. That was there. pretty good. And there's also like a node bots thing there, which is pretty freaking awesome. I liked all the ideas basically, except for Ansible because I'm not really a huge Ansible dude. But I, I know just like the like name Ansible because you know, fast yeah. all night. You know, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Totally. And like the, the people behind that are also really cool. The virtual machines and stuff. Uh, if, if you're down for virtual machine stuff, you can absolutely check that out. Anyhow, if you have any interest in doing hackathon stuff, but also helping you do make things better, this is the place to do it. Cause there are lots of, you know, lots of food and lots of people and stuff to hang out with and talk about making stuff better, which is cool. Mm-hmm. I think, the, I think the reason why it's mainly, uh, it's it's mainly IT staff is because a lot of the stuff is like projects that probably people wouldn't want to work on if they're not IT staff. Yeah. Yeah. And is it a paid time for them? No, I don't think it is paid. Okay. Well, but I would love to go. But it'll make your back. paid time so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> if you do it right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just like cool hanging outing stuff with cool people. If it's not your thing, that's fine too, but I'm I'm gonna stop by, even though I, I'm gonna take days off for it. Nice. I've 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 been looking at that thing like for the past three years, and I've never actually gone. So mm-hmm. 
Sounds like you will have a blast. Definitely. Or at least try to. Yeah, if if you guys if you guys want to be there, you totally should because that'd be awesome. But yeah, also, it's a lot of U of M projects. So yeah, I get you. Either which way. So oh lord. Well, either way, mark it. Oh than, oh yeah. no! There we go. <sighs> That's that's not quite the former show title, but it's pretty dang close. So. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to get better. I I noticed how much I was doing it in uh, in in Europe too. So, and I'm sure everybody who is listening to you do it in Europe loved it. They did. They thought it was hilarious, especially <laughs> when we were like deciding which street to go. I was like, oh, we could go any which way. It doesn't matter to <laughs> oh, me. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, they see were in like, that context, oh, it makes sense. Yeah, probably. I would just say we could go any way. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. That's yeah. true. Any, any any way is probably the right way to do it. Actually, it's definitely objectively the right way to do it. But you know, vernacular. My vernacular is particularly silly. So speaking of you in uh, not the U.S. Yeah. About your your travels. Oh my gosh. Well, first off, Europe was so awesome, which you know, Brian, because you've been there and I you're going to Denmark and Sweden. So a little bit of Europe. That's. Those those are two of the coolest places in Europe, from what I've heard. I've never been to either of them, so I guess I can't really objectively speak. I but I'm, to a I'm small sure. port, port town in Sweden and a national park for one night. So I haven't really seen Sweden, but I've technically been there. That's awesome. That's well, you had you had to get your passport stamped, right? You had to go through border protection or whatever in Sweden. Uh, actually, I actually have my passport right here. I don't think nice. I did. Oh, but. <laughs> uh, Iceland, Iceland. I don't think... Yeah, I think it's all the EU. You don't have to. Or at least... Oh, really? Scandinavia. Nice. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I had to I had to stamp my passport everywhere because... Probably because I was flying. I don't know. Did you fly to Sweden? No, I drove. It was... Oh. It's really close to Denmark. But my passport is from 2010, so it's got like 16-year-old me as a photo. Oh, nice. You're bad. Yeah, well, I mean... When when we got our passports for this trip, we were kind of freaking out because it seemed like it was very like it was all like washed out, and your face was like basically unrecognizable, mm-hmm. and your hair color was all off. So like I looked like blonde, and I mean with this haircut and blonde, I look kind of sketchy. So oh, sketchier than usual. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're going to Europe, no less. Yeah, so that's it's um yeah. At least I wasn't going to Germany. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> oh lordy. Um, so uh past all the passport stuff and the travely things, which the travely things were pretty cool. Uh, one of the things I thought was most interesting is how I got mobile data there. So I, I expressed some concern on previous episodes of PodKit that um, that I uh, I probably would not have any stable internet connection when I was there. Um, and for the first like 48 hours of the trip, that was true. Um, but then um, like, uh, like the feedback that we got from... Uh, from Ian last uh, last episode or two episodes ago, kind of kind of got me thinking that w- I should probably explore actual ways to get mobile data while I was abroad, i.e., not paying through the nose from Verizon. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, sure enough, found this little outfit called Three, um, which is I think mostly in the UK, but they also w- work in other countries. I know in Italy as well, um, and I think in Hong Kong. I, I could be wrong about that, um, but. Um, Three is kind of a really cool network provider and that they have um, like the usual sort of SIM plans, pay as you go stuff and the contract stuff in the UK. Um, And the UK cellular market is kind of weird in some ways, but three is unique because they'll let you, once you purchase a data allowance, you can bring it to any other European country where they have a partner um, and use it for free for for no additional charge. And I'm not getting all the terms and conditions right, but I don't need to because I'm not a representative of their company. So um, it's it's really cool though because I just bought a bunch of gigs and went from London to France and everything worked. Nice. And then I went from France to France to Rome and everything worked. So I had like um, I think we got six gigs of data um, in the UK and we used them in the UK. Used them uh, oh, it was. Good question. Uh, that's for me and for my family. So there are four of us, uh, each with iPhones. I had an iPad and an iPhone. Um, you get a SIM for but, both, or do you not have a three G iPad? Yeah, that's, really that's, a, that's, that's a real good question. Um, this is this is kind of the fun fest, right? Um, so 
I originally brought an old unlocked iPhone 5 to use because um, my, my 5S, I figured it was still locked and it wouldn't work. Later, I found out that all Verizon iPhones um, since like the 5 are completely unlocked and can be used internationally with a SIM card swap, which is pretty dang cool. Um, but I didn't know that before I left. Uh, any which way. Oh, Lordy. Mark oh, again. again. <laughs> Fail. Um, you just facepalm there. It's yeah, I, I, I facepalmed. Um, see, this, this is this is why... Uh, this is... Yeah. Um, I stifled another any which way there. The... the um, so what I didn't, when I was reading the terms and conditions of, of 3's cellular agreement, I read that um, you can't use data SIMs, data-only SIMs in cell phones, and then use the phone as a, as a um, personal hotspot. And I was like, hmm, that's, that's a little sketchy. I don't want to deal with that. Yeah, that is so, kind of weird. So I ended up buying uh, um, a wireless hotspot, like a, a dedicated, like Verizon calls them MiFi's or Jetpacks. Um, I got one of those. Um, it was really actually pretty reasonably priced in comparison to what it was in the u.s i think um like the starter kit which comes with like two gigs free data and um the the hotspot something like that um one or two gigs free i guess i don't remember which um it's it was like uh 50 pounds or like 80 85 90 90 dollars uh for the for the hotspot and for the two two gigs which i mean compared to verizon is pretty freaking awesome oh yeah um, mm-hmm. because, I mean, when you figure the hotspot itself is at cost about like $30, $30, something like that, $30, $40, $50, depending on where you get it from. Um, and then the data from Verizon is like 50 basically. <laughs> so that, that's, that's $50 for 100 meg, mind you, not for 2 gig. Um, so yeah. I, I, felt, uh, I, I felt like we made a pretty, pretty darn good deal there. The one trick, though, was that um, I had to buy all my data in the UK because if you want to reload the um the sim card with data um with a credit card online you have to have a uk credit card or as they call it a uk bank card Hmm. uh with with a with a uk address oh that's sucky yeah so i just i just bought a bunch of data there and was like worst case scenario um the usa is actually one of the partner countries where you can use your data allowance for free oh nice i figured figured worst case scenario i bring it home and use the remaining gigs uh here oh yeah definitely so does the yeah. hotspot work here too? Then just overall, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's good. It it partner. It's a, a T-Mobile's network. Oh, so. good. Oh, right, Deutsche Telekom. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Yep. So it's it's. Uh, I think in in the UK they have agreements with Orange and uh, one other carrier that I never heard of before. I think it, it's mostly Orange or O2, um, and then there's one like really random one. I never got Vodafone though. I think that's because Vodafone. Does Vodafone use CDMA too? I could I could be wrong about that. Instead instead of GSM, that is. Um, I'm not sure. Vodafone Vodafone be tripping. They they do what they do. They um, might use GSM, but I don't know. Yeah, who knows? I, I was what, under the impression that all the major countries not in the U.S. In other words, so not the U.S. They uh, yeah. use CDMA nowhere. Like That's they, what I thought too. Uh, only Japan's SoftBank or. Some Japan carrier use CDMA because they were foolish. Ah, uh, <laughs> they're they're like secondary, you know, like sixth place carriers. I feel. Yeah, just like Sprint. Yeah. So um, now I'm I'm getting all curious about mine. So I'm looking at my phone model to see what bands of LTE and stuff it supports. To figure out what carrier would be best to get in Denmark. Well, what yeah. phone do you have? Don't you have a six? Yeah, but there's it's like the USA GSM version. But isn't so it's, uh, it's different? Than but that. isn't it a world phone in general? Doesn't it cover all the bands? Yes, but slightly different bands than the European GSM version well, that's or the sucky. non-US one. It might just mean that the US has more bands. I'm that's not what I was sure. thinking. Yeah, I'm going to find a table. I have a fifteen forty nine. Maybe Apple will have this, but I'm just looking for. Mm-hmm. So, like, I've I've been told my uh, Nexus Six. I think that's what my phone's called. It's a world phone, allegedly. And it would let me take it, you know, pretty much anywhere, and it would allegedly have a band that would work. Nice, that's awesome. Unless I go, you know, in the middle of a uh, prairie in Minnesota, where there is no service anywhere from any carrier. You can't. You can't even. Uh... Oh, so it doesn't have like shortwave support then? No shortwave. No satellite support. No, no, unfortunately. So, so you can't like ham radio in or anything. Uh, you know, I've been looking into that. Uh, I've been learning some uh, Q codes. Yeah. See. 
I, I wish, uh, I, I think I heard that like iOS nine was going to add ham radio support. Um, so maybe you should, maybe you should come over to the dark side. I might have to, because that, that is very appealing. I, I think, I think it's a hashtag killer feature. I could be wrong though. Uh, well, it's a tent pole feature at least. Ah, <laughs> uh, lordy. That's awesome. So yeah. far, all here's in the mark will support any version of LTE I have minus nice. the CDMA and carrier. So that's nice to know. Yeah, I have options. Sweet. Are are you all on Verizon in the U.S. or I am on I'm T-Mobile. On... Ah, T-Mobile prepaid. That is. We you. Boo right. CDMA. Boo. Are you AT and T, Brian? Yeah, I got my iPhone before before AT and T lost their exclusive. Oh. I got mine in 2010. Gotcha. See, uh, see, my family has from the beginning. Um, understood that uh, what well, well, we we knew that we could only accept Verizon um, for reasons that I don't I well that I kind of mostly understand but um, but we on, we only ever wanted Verizon's network we couldn't we couldn't have AT and T where we live actually one of our neighbors used to have AT and T phones and our area just was never had service granted this is back in two thousand and four yeah um, when cell phones were different and much different much different. It was it was a different time. Yeah, Verizon is better in Morris for sure. Mm-hmm. I will have no service when Verizon is four hours or something. Mm-hmm. But it, I mean, there's Wi-Fi on campus. It doesn't bother me too much. It's totally. annoying sometimes for sure, but it's not the end of the world. And I'm you know I have one more semester left there. Um, it was mm-hmm. weird when I first got my iPhone four. I'd had like three bars in my house. I currently have yeah. two right now. I think I had three a second ago on my six. But there was a time where I had my iPhone 4 for a little while, and then all of a sudden it jumped up to five bars all the time. I could get four in my basement. Nice. But it, it seems to have gone down a little bit. It might be because it's summer right now, and so yeah. there are more leaves. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But also probably LTE, I would imagine, doesn't go quite as far because it's higher bandwidth. So mm-hmm. it's a higher spectrum. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, like, and now AT&T's network's pretty much at parity with Verizon's as far as I, as far as I understand it. Um that's just, it's just really funny how we were stuck on CDMA because for for essentially you know manufactured reasons pretty much for, for the longest time yeah for actually objectively manufactured reasons well they kind don't the same they, reason I'm stuck on that well maybe maybe not yeah. not quite the same reason that's true but so my uh, my mom has a phone on Virgin Mobile which is uh, Sprint yeah. and VNO and. Her phone's awful, so I want her to get a real phone, and I want her to come over to the, you know, GSM world where you can just plug your SIM card into your phone and it just works. It's great. And so um, she does. She works here in you know Minneapolis, but that uh, is the usual. Sometimes she has to go out somewhere else in the state for go lives when they have to turn on support for various clinics and stuff. And so yeah. um, I've looked at like doing like a, a straight talk. Uh, they're yeah. they're AT and T based, I think, and they have a little bit more coverage than T Mobile. Um, they're a little bit more expensive, but you know it's okay. Um, T Mobile prepaid's pretty good here, at least in the city. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of options for GSM non carrier exclusives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, so you said Straight Talk is AT and T based, so they're they're an MVNO for for AT and T. Um, they're, they're an MVNO for a lot of different things. So I think, oh. I think they are, they're aggregated in a way. So mm-hmm. you, you could, if you have a CDMA phone, I'm pretty sure you can do it. For some reason, if you have a CDMA phone that's unlocked, which is a miracle, I think you can do it, <laughs> um, on straight talk also. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. See, I, I didn't know that at and well, I take that back. AT&T has done that before, haven't they? Like they did that with Amazon for the Kindles back in the right. day. Yep. Where they sell spectrum. Yeah. Well, I think there's also like uh, the GoPhone was traditionally an AT&T MVNO, even though yeah. they're, you know, their own company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. AT&T Go. That was their prepaid, right? Yep. Yeah, right. I think, and, and so, but there's also another company um, that before AT&T owned GoPhone, I think it was also MVNO-like. Nice. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I've always just had AT and T. My first phone was the iPhone four in two thousand ten. Um, so I made it junior year of high school before getting a phone. But my sister had had a prepaid uh, Virgin Mobile phone since she was in junior high, and my dad had a track phone. So 
actually my my grandpa also has a cell phone it's, it's a track phone it's at least a 10 year old model you know one of the nokia bricks oh those are black, awesome black and white display yeah oh those are so cool he has his phone off all the time except if he's going somewhere on like a trip so we I never call him on that or anything but except yeah. when he's you know, not at home oh so i was but, totally thinking about track phone not not go phone so track phone mm. is the company that is the owner of track phone net 10 total wireless straight talk safe link telecal simple mobile and page plus cellular they oh, wow. operate on yeah. Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile, and U.S. Cellular. Whoa. So they're everybody. That's crazy. So they, they, have, like, they have like a killer network then. That's like everybody. I, it does appear to be everybody, yep. So wow. like... Do, do you guys have you like have you all ever used track phone? Is it is it any good? I, it, I, I mean, it I've never like done it personally. I've used it on flip phones and non smartphones, so no data or anything. But but theoretically, if you get a track phone and just roam on any carrier, no matter what protocol, because you just have a phone that works on CDMA or GSM, you just. Uh, I, I think so, as long as you had a phone that could you know have all those radios and all those bands. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know one of my friends who uh, uh, do you know Max Marty? He went to Mars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he had straight talk, I think, on his Nexus Five, and uh, he always liked it a lot. Nice. Hmm. Yeah, I've 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 heard good things, but um, yeah, my my family, we are we are uh, we have sold our souls to Verizon, unfortunately. That's and okay. You'll get them back someday. W- will we though? Uh, our two-year contract is well. Our two our two-year contracts are now sufficiently staggered that. Oh, um, hmm. <laughs> I think we're month to month. Yeah, we're we're on. We're, uh, although with with our plan, we have data for a, a pretty decent price. We've ten shared across the four of us, plus packs and minutes. Um, but then all our phones are not subsidized, and so we have oh. AT&T next. Um, my mom and I's iPhone six. My dad and sister's iPhones are old enough that they uh, any subsidies that we're on were just voided, and AT&T covered the when we switch to the chip family plan. Oh, that's nice of them. Um, so, but it means that my mom and I have to pay full price for iPhones. Oh so, my gosh. I mean, I've worked with my mom. I've, I've paid half of plus tax, 375 plus $6 in tax for the, the 64 gig version, which is still worth it to me. Yeah, totally. So I was just but, looking at the Straight Talk website, $45 a month for unlimited... Uh, talk and text and five gigabytes of LTE of whatever that equals there on the network. So that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but what's uh, the catch? Uh, I think the catch is that you're on straight talk, and you have to <laughs> you have to bring your own phone. I think that's the catch. Yeah. Uh yeah. And and your uh, wasn't it like somebody's campaign slogan? Not to take this in a political direction, but. I guess I'm kind of taking this in a political direction because that was somebody's campaign slogan once, wasn't it? Like McCain Palin? I don't don't know. No. Yeah, they were like McCain Palin's boss was called like the Straight Talk Express or something. Uh, I I I totally was um, not paying attention at that time. Maybe you're right. Who knows? I'm 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 a weirdo, and I was I was paying attention to that sort of thing when what was it? Eighth grade? Yeah, 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 2008. Uh huh. Exactly. That's, yeah, I think that's... I was in ninth grade, maybe. Yeah, it was a long time ago. But you, you would have been in tenth. That would have been in ninth. I don't know. Still a long Gosh. time ago. Yeah. That was that was eight years ago almost. Yeah, Good I would Lord have been in tenth. You're right. Still wow. too long ago. Before I before I start feeling bad about myself, let's uh let's move on to the next thing. Oh, okay, let's do that. <laughs> um. So Oracle. Well, some audio issues are going on there. What's up? Everything all right? I had a bunch of audio issues. Oh, am I, I am know. I still am I still coming through for you, or not really, or possibly? Kind of. Although I think Ryan looks frozen, at no. least to me. Oh no, neither is open. Okay, I don't know what happened. I I'm just sitting still. Okay. <laughs> bad, bad for me again. Maybe is it just me or is it you guys? Well, too? occasionally you are breaking up, but yeah, yeah. I I can I can hear you loud and clear, Ryan. That's we might good. Yeah, uh... I missed Ryan's complete thing. Well, then. maybe it's me. I don't know. Whatever. Let's continue. The internet. Oracle. What is the internet? I blame Oracle. Oracle's yeah, so at fault. Always. Larry Ellison. Dang it. That kid. What's he up to? Uh, two bad, Actually, bad things. Definitely. 
uh, he he is kind of like um, the supervillain of uh, of uh, the tech CEOs, kind of. Kinda uh, the polite Kinda. supervillain, of course. Totally, he, he's like he's like Tony Stark, but with a little bit of like a, a I don't know. Well, instead of being somewhat clueless about people, he's knowledgeable about people, but clueless on being nice to the world. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's a good way to put it. Um, but speaking of things that Larry Ellison's up to, apparently he had a webcast a while ago where he announced that, um, uh, that Oracle is going to start doing Amazon web services stuff, but which is to say that they're trying to compete with Amazon web services. Um, and that looks like they're taking it really seriously. Um, now I feel like Ellison was a guy way back in the day who was like, the cloud is the thing. It's the thing that's going to happen. Yet Amazon kind of beat them to the punch on this. Um, with with AWS. I mean in a way I think that's really true but in a different way maybe it's sort of also different anyway because Oracle was always uh kind of going down that IBM route like custom solutions like we'll host your cloud but yeah. we get to do all of it and you just go and just you just pay us and we'll d- just do it all. Like an exclusive yeah. contract for enterprise and de- uh, environments. Right. That's what I've kind of Like AWS is kind of like okay, here you go. You can have the servers, you figure it out now. It's more yeah. kind of independent developers and small groups. Yeah, definitely, feel. definitely. Well, yeah, or, Oracle's I mean, never really been about the the the, the little guy. That's no, for sure. not at all. Unless unless Oracle's trying to buy the little guy. Yeah, or like a little yeah. island, for example. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Just a small island. Just have you ever used? Island. Um. So have you have either of you ever used AWS at all? Oh yeah, all I the time. got a free trial maybe almost a year ago, but I haven't done anything with it. Yeah, I, I was I, on that free trial, you know, years ago, and it was great. So I decided to put everything I've ever loved on it. Are you still? I probably should have done something. Are what? you still using it, Ryan? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so the the podcast files are stored on the uh, S3, and yeah. um, I've used some of their other, like you know, spin up a little server for five minutes things. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I've I've only ever used EC2. I wanted to get into S3, but my free trial ran out before I before I got a chance to mess with it. But that was like I was young and naive, yeah. and I didn't know what serv- what storage really was about. Right. So. Well, you know, S3s. You know, it's good and it's bad. Uh, like if, for example, the podcast became horrendously popular, and by the podcast I mean the network in general, mm-hmm. the prices don't scale like. Oh, you just had fifty billion downloads. Okay, well, that's like dirt cheap. No, you actually have to pay a lot. So the yeah. the hosting co- or the bandwidth cost, I guess, is what really ends up getting you. The storage costs yeah. are pretty much free at that point. Yeah, nice. Well, sort of nice. It has the potential to be nice. Yeah. Nice. So for for our usage, it's pretty good. Most podcast groups don't use S three for their storage or hosting. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and for this network, you got pocket right <laughs> yeah right um i've you I, I i haven't used it but i've looked at um the google cloud engine something mm-hmm. uh they have pretty good rates too oh. and of course um azure from the microsoft has a uh, pretty good service also hmm. Hmm. yeah I've, I've heard good things about azure i've never really used it because um because, because microsoft i guess you know, I always used but, to think that same thing because Microsoft, like, I'm not touching that. You don't know when it's going to break or change or they're going to suddenly charge yeah. you more. Yeah. In order to retrieve I, I, your file, you must apply for a license. Oh, invalid license. No files for you. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. Mm, what about that you? Is exactly something right. like Mediafire or something, you know, like a file sharing website that you can link to this to the files. Probably um, bring in terms of search. I don't think Mediafire would work because you'd have to like. Doesn't Mediafire make you click like a link in order to download a file? Because it's not, it's not direct yeah. download, is it? I think Mediafire. Yeah, is well, not direct download. some places you can, but it opens a new tab. No, some places I've seen you can do direct link, but yeah. Oh, nice. I don't know. See, I I use Dropbox to do web hosting back when Dropbox would allow you to do that. Yep. And yeah, that, me too. that lasted for like six months, and then they were like. Mm. Come on, pal. That's not what this is about. Nope. Yeah, I remember seeing tons of tutorials on like, hey, make your own little website using Dropbox. And it's yeah, like, yeah, I just had a, a tiny URL pointing to a yep. file in Dropbox. It's great. Did you guys ever have .tk domain names? Uh, I didn't do it, but I saw so many people who did. Oh, totally. Um, it, it was just like a, the 
.tk domain. So any anything that ends in .tk, they offered like free domain names. Oh my gosh, it looks like they still do. Well, that's that's interesting. Um, I'm going to put that in the show notes then because this is how uh, how how fancy is that? That is not the URL. <laughs> it keeps it. I'm 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 uh, I'm uh, forever cursed to keep pasting in the the campus code fast link uh, until until the end of time. Sorry guys. Um, but what I have in, in the show notes now is uh, the the link to dot tk, which is dot period. <laughs> oh my gosh! Like how how, how do they make any money on these dot tk, TK. And, and this this thing? Like how do they do it? Like I have no idea. It's a company called Freenom apparently, which is uh, let's well let's see what Freenom is up to. They're probably pretty sketch, but um, no, well, the I government of Tokyo Lao probably gets no other attention otherwise. So I'm sure maybe that's why. I know I uh, I had a, a dot cc domain free for a year once too. Nice. I really do much with it though. I think actually I pointed that to Dropbox. I had the Dropbox website for probably like a year, a little longer than I should have. But mm-hmm. I get you. Domain names. We should. Uh, so I know we kind of mentioned this before, but we should eventually, as maybe in like six months, if we're if we're if we're all available and all willing, we should do like a domain name retrospective of all the domain names we've purchased oh that'd be so much wouldn't fun. That be fun wouldn't it be awesome oh of course maybe, maybe maybe based on that response maybe we should move it up to like next week <laughs> okay um, then. i have my third domain expires in uh october so before then okay october let's do it time. yeah my uh, uh, my anyway. um anime yeah, blog but... um domain is coming up for renewal soon i think i'm going to renew it even though i don't write there anymore nice yeah no i hmm? gotta archive it so people later can go back and see what you did 10 years ago. You know, it's funny because people yeah. still view those stupid posts. <laughs> and nice. I, on average, I think I get more traffic there than on my real blog. How much traffic do you get? Well, you know, at least 30 visits a day. Wow. I know. <laughs> and there's just a bunch of old anime review ramblings. Like the, there's no content <laughs> of value. A tiny ad on each page and pay for you the pay for the domain name. I doubt it would even come close. Layer code it with ads, nothing but. Uh, I don't like ads personally. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I well, I have mixed feelings about ads, which would be another interesting thing that we should talk about. It's going in the topics list, definitely. One of the things that I'm studying is kind of could be loosely considered advertising, and I would probably like to at some point have some sort of knowledge or work in some way of, of marketing things at some point. Um, but also, ads are dumb. Quote, Brandon Johnson, 2015. You just, uh-huh. you, just need, you just need the ads from the deck and you'll be good. <laughs> That's what John Gruber uses, right? Yeah, yep. a, lot of, a lot of the hipsters. And... Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Brandon, did you see that WebKit in uh, iOS 9 and El Capitan will support WebKit-based ad blocking or content blocking, as they say? Yeah, I heard about that. That I seems about that. really interesting. Like, I... I mean, as so so in in the in the marketing field, like it, it's kind of difficult to be like, well, now now all your like really like the way I see it is like the the really crummy like search ads, like Google Google ad, uh, oh my gosh, AdWords and stuff. Like that's probably a lot of the stuff that's going to get blocked, and you know, because it's really easy to just be like, okay, yeah, whatever, this is AdWords, you know, shut up. Um, you know, it's funny because like those are the ads that I don't even care if I really see at all. Exactly, because we're programmed to ignore them, right? Yeah. Well, I am programmed to ignore them. However, every time my dad or mom search for anything on Google and it's the first link up on top, they click it because they just don't get it. Yeah. I will. I will say occasionally, if I like today at work, I Google searched Amazon because I hit enter before remembering to type dot com. Yeah. And I clicked the ad on Google that went to Amazon. Because Unacceptable. Like, well, whatever. I'll give them money. No. It took longer to load, though, because of all the redirects. Of course. Yeah. I mean, like... So, like, the ads that I have a bigger problem with are... Mm-hmm. So, I don't know what happened to The Verge. Uh, Neil I. Patel decided to destroy it. But, you know, whatever. I'm not bitter. Totally am. And, um, <laughs> like, The Verge, for example, used to have less ads, I think, or uh, that I uh-huh. could tell... But now they just have ads smeared across this whole website. So, like, so when I load The Verge in Safari, which doesn't have any ad blocking right now, 
Um, I see when I go there, this big, the visionary LS Lexus car, yeah. overbleed, annoying of piece of crap thing. Yeah. This is unacceptable. Okay. So then if we scroll down, uh, there's another car ad scrolling down some more. Another car ad almost just as big as the full bleed oh, car totally. ad from above. Uh, scrolling down some more, scrolling down some more, some more, some more, more. Oh, here's, here's an article about a car on the verge. Okay. I guess that's not an ad. Um, scrolling down some more, more. Oh, look, a little banner ad at the bottom. Okay, that's great. Well, so on a desktop or on a laptop, I guess it's okay to have these kind of big full bleed ads, you know, especially on the home page. I guess maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then there's a Samsung Galaxy Tab S on an individual page, and then there's another uh, sidebar square ad, and then at yeah. the bottom there's another full bleed or not full bleed, but full column ad, and then another square ad, and another banner ad. So that's like six or seven ads of the same product all on the same page. Yeah. Ugh. Now, that's fine, I guess, on a desktop. But on mobile, the whole screen is taken up work. by ads. And the latency those ads add, haha, <laughs> ads mm-hmm. add, to the page time for, you know, ad- clicking or tapping or loading or whatever is terrible. I hate the and the phone with a full screen pop-up you have to X out of. And if you miss it, you go to the ad. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And there are ones like sites like 9 to 5 Mac, which have little banner ads at the bottom with an X that you can remove. But like, it's even older, like iPhone 4S, and you're on there. That ad takes up a considerably large amount of the screen real estate. And so you just have this little bit of ad space on there, especially if you have a toolbar that floats at the top. It's just <clears throat> mobile ads. Desktop ads, I think, are okay. I mean, some are obviously way worse than others. But even though there are ones like... I think Bloom, Bloomberg or, or Forbes has, you know, you click a link and it puts you at a page, the ad full screen below and saying continue to the site in five seconds or yep. something. Uh, yeah. Forbes yeah. Is, is notorious for having that, that interstitial ad that, that yeah. forces you to like, look at this thing for five seconds or skip it. it, yeah. it you know, just, oh. and it doesn't auto skip it for you. You no. have to wait five and then click it. Yep. Um, yeah. It's like all like, it's like ad fly or these other, you know, URL, yeah, the like, URL ad sites, yep. That give you ads, and people link up like 10 in a row. Oh, Don't totally. Why I know that, but... Uh, <laughs> so I, um, a few years ago, uh, Paul Thurot, he's one of the Windows evangelists, one of few Microsoft, you know, he's kind of like the mm-hmm. daring fireball John Gruber yeah. of Windows and Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Um, I was reading uh, his site, Win Super site, something, something, on uh, my phone, which is an Android phone, as you might have heard. And mm-hmm. in the Android browser, his site would load, and you would start reading the first paragraph or so. And by that time, the ads would start loading. And the, mm-hmm. there was a like kind of pop-up modal box ad. Yeah. And you had to click on the little microscopic link. And because Android browser wasn't the Safari, it wouldn't you know resize the ad. It would only resize the text below it. Yeah, and so I complained to him on Twitter one day, and he's like, "Nope, can't help you." Jeez. Of course you can. You're the site. You're the yeah. site dude. Yeah, and it's thing. like, well, you know, when your ads are causing people to be angry, then you know you've got a problem. That's that's such like a uh, yeah. That's, and that's 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 the problem with ads. It's having ads is a necessity, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with some ads. I don't use an ad blocker anymore. I had one for a couple of years. Um, I got rid of it due to page loading times and ridiculous RAM usage. Um, but then um, it's the websites and how many they put in and the types of ads that they do. Yeah. They like completely overtake and try to force one more in. And then the floating ads and the pop-ups are the worst. Totally. And, that, and that's what's driving people to block more ads. And that's, and then websites retaliate by showing more ads. And in the end, they're just hurting themselves and they need to have totally. good ads totally and well, like you know, that's yeah go no i was just gonna say like that's that's like where there, there's a section of the marketing discipline that's that's like trying to figure out what good ads are and by good ads we mean stuff that doesn't try to make people that doesn't make people feel like upset that they're being deceived or it doesn't block people from from the from the thing that they're trying to read in, in a way that's upsetting like yeah we don't want to we don't want to be enemies guys and then and then like and then, like the AdWords, the um, what, what's the other one? There's like something that, that's named after like some sort of amphibious animal that um, that is representative of an ad network of some sort. I don't really recall it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. But the one that does the the ads that you have to scroll past and yep. 
they're like, and they just do it anyway because whatever they're selling ads and they make all the money because because the world is unfair. But um, the uh, like the the end result is that there's like that that stress in the field between people who do the content farmy sort of thing or the um, the the scroll ads and then the people who are trying to in in theory fig- figure out other ways that are less intrusive to make that happen and it's it's weird to see where as an industry that's that's heading and i guess i don't really know particularly which which one's going to win out but it looks like the i mean like i more has that too and the verge definitely has the um the they like to plaster everything left and right as as we've dissected at length right so, uh, I, I, I even posted a picture so yes we dissected mm-hmm. it all right <laughs> Other than the Verge's top giant sixty percent of the page thing, I don't think that's overkill at all on their site. Well, especially on a desktop, but I think it's it's. Let me show you. Let me. Uh, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll share I'm a picture up. on mobile, and then you can see what you think. Um, it'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute. By far much worse. Definitely, I mean, it has to be because people are on their phones more than their computers nowadays, and so oh, totally. yeah. But I think it's. I think you have to be even more responsible, or at least, ironically, responsive to um yeah. the the constraints of mobile and totally it's harder to like you know everybody makes fun of uh, android for their scrolling performance and it's not a lie and it's not a joke android sucks at scrolling but you know what makes it worse loading more crap totally and yeah, um, yeah. literally full screen if you're on the verge you have their their toolbar with a little hamburger menu yeah the rest of the page that you can see is that lexus ad and then you keep scrolling and there's more but Oh my gosh! Yeah, see, like the the thing about that the the verge that kills me is that um and and you you mentioned this before Ryan that like it feels like it's being lazy loaded right so it it um the yep. the ad script isn't actually there at the times so you're like you start reading it yep. as as you said about the Windows Super site right you start reading it and then you're like oh wait a second there are ads that are covering this uh-huh. well crap like. If if you're gonna do that, at least have it block everything first, so you're not right. you don't feel like you're being baited and switched. Mm-hmm. Like, but I will say on the version, mobile version on their homepage at least, they only have two ads. Yeah, the massive one at the top, and then a tiny banner ad at the bottom. And so overall, it's not horrible after you get over the fact that you can't see anything when you first load the page, which is I think a problem. Would yeah, it's kind of uh kind of weird. I think this is what they call it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we'll have to we'll have to see. Hopefully, at some point, people will figure it out. Like, do do you guys do you guys think that um, you know, like the the um serial slash um um, I guess our our colleagues on, on the um on the relay FMs and five by fives of the world, like that that sort of sponsorship model. Do you think that has any any traction to supplant? this i mean like it, it, if you guys have listened to the verge cast recently you'll know that they're sponsored too by like um i think they were sponsored by lynda.com a while back yep. too and you know like do, do you think that that has any 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 possibility of supplanting that even for like text-based sites or um like places that have content in in the verges style you know other you know, than just their, their radio that's really that's a really tough thing to to, to answer so for podcasts yeah. i think it works really well because there's two or three ads per per show, and uh, you know the the they tend to be a lot more targeted, especially mm-hmm. in the tech crowd, like totally. Squarespace. On the other hand, maybe that's not targeted. I don't yeah. know. It's kind of, it it depends. And, and you just come up and hit thirty second forward like five six times, and you're good. Right. I mean, I remember mm-hmm. when I started listening to a podcast a lot on Twit. They on all their shows, they would have the same ad and the mm-hmm. same guy reading it four times a day and it got kind of repetitive. I don't, totally. I don't need to hear the same audible ad six times a day. Um, I don't know for text ads. It's really hard because so then what in the middle of the story you're reading this story brought to you by Squarespace. Have you ever made, wanted to make a website Squarespace now? And I don't know if that's going to work. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, let, let me, let me see if I can find a, an, an example of it. I think Mashable did, did a couple of, a couple of things that are like what, I, what I'm thinking about right here. Um, but it's, it, it's almost exactly like that. I know, I know it sounds weird, but um, does, does the Mashable name drop there help at all? And in, in kind of clarifying what I'm trying to get out um, of like have a little blurb, a paragraph in about, I'm, I'm trying to, 
I'm trying to catch an example here, and of course I can't now that I said it. But um, I, I guess another another way to think about it would be like the the sort of sponsorships that they have on Daring Fireball and and Six Colors and such. But well, they're you know, even a little bit different because those are those aren't interrupting content, right? right? And it's, I think that's one of the biggest things. I I don't know how that would work for a site like Mashable because who reads Mashable through, or who gets the notice of new Mashable content through just an RSS feed or just Twitter? Because nobody goes mm-hmm. during Fireball. Just going to their homepage. You see most of their stuff on these sites as linked articles on Twitter or Facebook or other social media. So it's people mm-hmm. sharing their sites. And so it needs to be on the right. page itself rather than exactly. the article itself rather than the feed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I no, I can't, I can't believe I lost it, but there, there's the Mashable had some series, uh, where they, where they wrote about startups for a while. Um, and, and they, um, and instead of being like promoted content, it just it was just like uh, there was just a little sponsorship blurb in the middle. But I'm of course not finding them anymore, so I it's possible know. that I'm I'm full of crap. But I think you guys are absolutely right. You know, it's it's definitely it's definitely different for for text or, or for yeah for text like um, media like that. But I mean, I have to say, like the six colors and and daring fireball subsidies have been weirdly um, like they they've worked pretty well for. <laughs> worked pretty well for me because i've been you know i've i've i don't have audible but i've i've used hover i've used uh um i used squarespace for a while just use the free trial for that though yeah i I, I, when i tried squarespace of course i um i'm far too good for that because you know Mm -hmm. i can html and i can javascript and i can css turns out um but I know a lot of people can't, so whenever I, any, anybody I knew who wanted a website, it's like, well, how about if you try Squarespace first, and if you need something better than that, talk to me again. Totally. Yeah. That's, and then, that's... of course, that was the perfect solution, because I knew, deep down, nobody would ever actually make a website, unless, and why would they be asking if they actually wanted to make one? They would just Google it. Totally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Unless they wanted you to make them one, but but that's <laughs> but that's the thing. People don't really want to make a website; they just want to have a website to go to. Like yeah. nine times out of ten, normal people don't want to be involved in making content. Yeah. And I also have one more thing to say about the ads in general. Like, yeah, anybody can go and find a you know AdWords or image ad provider. Like, even if you just run a small you know thousand views per month blog anybody can find Mm -hmm. that but i think it's a lot harder to find something for um you know your podcast like so here on the nexus we maybe get you know a hundred downloads per episode at most max in a month and nobody's ever going to sponsor that uh with text or with with uh with like uh, insert ads like live reads Mm -hmm. so i mean maybe that's good for good for merlin right um, but not, mm-hmm. not good enough for normal people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you kind of yeah. have to, be, yeah, I feel like a lot of their, you know, cheaper ads that are more intrusive. And before you start getting tons of people there, it's really hard to do a good, clean, not intrusive job with ads. Yeah. When you have low traffic, when you first start out with ads. Definitely. But Hey, I mean, content creation is fun anyway, right guys? Oh yeah. Especially, you know, when you just do it for fun. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's see. Uh, what are you guys doing this week? Anything fun? Uh, I've been working a lot on uh, my uh, CMS for the Nexus. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I've actually been doing pretty well. I just coded today. In fact, the tool that I use on the CMS, so you put in the uh, MP3 URL from Amazon Web Services S3, and it mm-hmm. will go and fetch the like the first couple of megabytes of the MP3, and it will analyze it for the ID3 frame tags, and the nice. and it'll calculate the duration of the podcast episode, and pre-populate all of that so I don't have to ever type it ever again. Oh, wonderful! Nice. So that's pretty that's cool. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm using Guzzle and uh, ID3 or Git ID3 libraries from Composer for that. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. There's there's a couple of quirks like. If your website or, you know, for some reason, if I ever change from AWS, it might not work because I need, um, download part. Like it, you can do, yeah. you can, you can download just a part of a file and that yeah. saves me the time of having to download the whole file. 
Yeah. And for some Plus reason, you're paying for anyway. Well, right, exactly. Although my inconsequential download won't cost much cuz I'm the only one doing it. Um yeah, it's pretty mm-hmm. cool. It works. Um you know, it's just kind of prototypey right now. I'll refactor it later, but it's pretty cool. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, I want to see that when you're done with the whole thing. Oh, definitely. Totally, yeah. Everybody will be seeing it. I'll never stop talking about it. <laughs> awesome. You're going to GitHub it? Oh, it's actually on Bitbucket right now in a private repo, but I can probably invite you if you want to see it anytime. Yeah, no, that'd be super cool. I, well, I, when, when you, well, when when you're, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I I kind of wanted to try something new with Bitbucket, and actually, Bitbucket's been really nice and great. But it's also what what's really cool about the Bitbucket is it's totally private, so you can have as many private repos as you want. Turns I'm out, trying to get these that- like I mean, it's, it's, it works just like GitHub, except it's Bitbucket. Yeah. Is Bitbucket an Atlassian product? It looks like it might be. Yeah, yeah, it yes, is. Yes, it yep. is. Mm-hmm. Oh, Atlassian taking over the world. Oh, yeah. Hip That's right. It's, it's like, it's, I mean, of all the companies to take down, they're, they're trying to take down GitHub and Slack, which are like artisanal software products du jour. Like they're, they're, yeah, exactly. And they're, and they're trying to enterpriseify them. Which is crazy because they're both already enterpriseified as is, sort mm-hmm. of, depending on who you ask. <sighs> so interesting to watch. Yeah, so that's what Dude. I've been doing. How about how about you guys? Nice. Um, well I worked on Hey Get Back to Work. Um I've been slowly poking around with Brian and not me. It got routing working. Stupid nice. me could figure it out at probably two in the morning when I worked on it last, I don't know. Um haven't really had time to work on it. Again, it's mostly weekends. Although I do have a four hour car ride. I'm um, going to Wisconsin and back. So a total of eight hours and I might work on it in the car at this coming weekend. So nice. hopefully I can work on it there without using too much uh, hotspot data for Stack Overflow articles. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I am uh, kind of still getting ready from jet lag. If you guys, um, hopefully I'm not too sketchy sounding. Slash no, you're fine. Right now, but... Um, I'm I'm still definitely getting over it. The the first day I got back, I was like, heck yeah! I got back at around one in the morning. I was like, heck yeah! I'm ready to go to work tomorrow at eight a.m. Uh, <laughs> and then I uh, realized that I was not scheduled to work at eight a.m. because I'm slightly smarter than that. Um, I was not scheduled to work at all on Thursday because I knew I'd be coming home around one a.m. That is a very uh, wise decision. So I got in the car and I was like, okay, so ready for this. And then I realized, wait a second. Um, that's that's not how this works at all. So I went back home and I went back to bed. Um, but I'm still I'm still kind of uh, not not quite uh, not quite used to it. It feels like uh, what time is it? It's almost nine. Yep. Uh, it feels it feels like closer to uh, two in the morning for me right now for some reason. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's but, pretty know. tough. I found when I went to Denmark 2010, I went there and I was up for probably 30 hours straight when I went there because I didn't really sleep too much on the plane. Oh, totally, yeah. Evening flights, and then, you know, the sun never quite sets when you're in the air that high. Yeah. I was more in the summer. It might be a little different this time, but then I just stayed up the whole day, crashed, super tired. But then I was, for the most part, adjusted pretty quickly just because I went to bed and slept good that night, and I was kind of adjusted. But then coming back, um, I was home for two days and then went to California and had another two hours. So I was at two days in, I was nine day, nine hours off. Oh, which, my gosh. It was a long week. I don't. I yeah. I slept and things, but I was just tired all the time. No, I bet. I bet. Yeah. Well, time zones. What are those about? Oh yeah. Right. Well, hopefully, hopefully this time when you go to Denmark, it'll be it'll be a little bit different. But I mean, sounds like sounds like you got a good way to handle it anyway. And if so, I have three weeks of winter break to come back to. So I'll be you'll fine. Yeah. yeah, you'll refresh yourself then. Exactly. So what do you guys think? Four episodes in, are we uh, are are we uh, good good for uh, good for another four at least? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I awesome. feel like we have all sorts of things to talk about. Oh, totally. Which is I'm, unusual. I need to I need to buy a couple more uh, domain names for our, uh, oh, our next no. week's uh, <laughs> domain extravaganza. That's so dangerous. I don't know about anything to put on domains. But you don't need to put anything on them. You just need to own them. Yeah, let's put landing pages <laughs> and say, "Go here for Brian and Bummy." Well, you can make a redirect totally. phase. Yes. <laughs> that that ends up putting you at, hey, get back to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lordy. So I, I hate to uh, hate to jump in here, but um, I have about two minutes remaining on my battery, which is ridiculous well, because it's been plugged in this whole time. That's perfect um, because my so timer just expired. I think uh, I think we're calling it. Are we yeah. calling it? Yeah. Well, where can we find you on the internet? 
Uh, I can be found on Twitter at uh, Brandon underscore MN, spelt the way that it's been spelt for the past four episodes. B R A N D O N underscore M N. M as in Mike, N as in November. Good. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at bman4789 or at tech4789 or uh, brianm.me or now heygetbacktu.org. Nice. <laughs> And you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at RyanMR, and of course on the Google Plus, which is where I paste pictures and videos of ads on the verge to make fun of them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun, uh, and you can uh, hear us again next week on the Podkit. New the Podkit. Podkit. I thought you were going to say multiple days, and I was like, that's not right. I saw you on there just yesterday, but then... Yeah, Imposter. Right. Up. All, all, all your artists are belong to us. I didn't even catch that last thing. It's, but it's it should be a little last off of the power supply. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. I, I don't know. I'm going to have to... So I've got an I'm even more perilous problem. <laughs> does, does anybody even know how computers even work Ooh. anymore? Oh, we lost Brandon. Okay, so my perilous problem is right now... I, I just noticed on the computer that's recording the show, the mouse is not responding. Like, it's not moving. But Audacity uh-huh. is still clearly recording, and the clock spinner is still clearly spinning, and mm. the time is still right, but neither the keyboard nor the mouse are responding anymore. <laughs>